wanted to tell the story about Milarepa that I like. There's so many, but uh, but there's uh, there's one story in particular uh, that I thought it would be nice to tell, where he became the teacher of the, and he converted in a way the goddesses of the Himalayas, Jomolhari and others, the goddess Terima, who you see a lot in Bhutan and around here, the long life goddess with her four sisters, the five goddesses of the Himalayas, Terima. And uh, it's the 28th chapter of the 100,000 Songs of Milarepa. And in that chapter, these five goddesses, who are kind of Himalayan ogresses at that point, they find Milarepa meditating around Mount Everest, Mount Kailash, especially Mount Everest, and they approach him as three giant ogresses. And so, and they say, ha ha, look at this cute little yogi. We're going to eat him up. What a wonderful, tasty dish. And there's huge giant ogres as he meets them. And then he says, don't mess with me. I'm going to meditate myself as Yamantaka, Hivadra, all these fierce forms, you know. And the more he meditates himself in fierce forms, uh, and he's a great adept, remember, the bigger they get as ogres. Is. Bigger and bigger and more fierce than him. <laughs> oh good, he's growing more arms. That'll be more, that'll be more little like hot dogs for us. Each arm will munch it down, you know. And they, had, and they sing these songs back and forth. And so finally he says, okay, uh, forgive me, I've been trying to like overawe you, that won't work. And obviously you're too powerful, you Himalayan goddesses. So instead what I'll do is I'll offer you a feast. So then he g does this marvelous thing, which is related to what they call in Tibetan the Jö tradition, the tradition of severance, it's called, I call it. And uh, he sits down and he goes into a meditation and the first thing he does is he projects his own wisdom in the form of a Dakini that's a female Buddha with this kind of special knife that has a curved blade like this with a hook at the end it's like a flaying knife actually is what it is but it, or a chopper <coughs> and with that knife she slices off the top of his skull neatly and cleanly and then she dismembers him completely and she puts the skull in a, in a tripod made of his arms and legs, which she slices up. And then she chops all the brain and all the flesh and every part of him in little t tasty bits and throws it into the skull, which is now a cauldron. And then she, her eyes, this is his own wisdom, her eyes blaze flame and ignite a fire underneath it and the cauldron starts bubbling and bubbling. And meanwhile, Milarepa, I'm not sure with what his tongue, with which part of his tongue at this point, he starts singing this song about how you five goddesses, you setting my goddesses, fierce ogresses, you have all been my mothers in previous lives, and you have like done all these things for me, and all beings also are. So I invite you as the foremost guest and all beings to this feast of my my inner being, of my of my coarse body. And I'm so delighted you give me the opportunity to make this sacrifice to you and to feed you in this way. And, uh, and so have a great feast, you know. And so, he, and so they, come, they, they partake of that feast and, uh, in some sense. And then he returns to his normal form at the end of it because he's a great adept. And then they're just turned into peaceful, beautiful goddesses and they're so happy. They don't even really, they share it with all beings. They don't really gobble him down. And then, he, and then he just is a manifestation, you know. But it was a genuine manifestation, and it relates to this practice that the Tibetans do, some Tibetan yogis called jö, which means severance, where you go out to a death ground, like we slept at last night, or the night before last, and you visualize this every day. And actually, those yogis, and even like the Dalai Lama, all the high lamas actually all do this meditation in the Vajra Yogini teaching. They all do it every single day. They go through a thing where they emanate their wisdom in the form of a fierce goddess. She chops them up, she dismembers them, chops them up, makes a feast out of them, boils them in a cauldron. And that's actually the inner offering relates to that, actually. There was a thing called the inner offering. That's why I said it wasn't just whiskey. <laughs> and, uh, and then they feed all beings with that as a way of, of giving yourself over to all beings. You know, like, instead of just dissolving into light, you actually make a feast of yourself and feed the beings. And then with that, then they really truly became the friends and helpers of Milarepa, those five goddesses. And instead of being fierce Himalayan ogresses, they became the goddesses of long life. Tzedding means long life. And they protect the beings of the Himalayas, and so they're very worshipped all through the Himalayas, those goddesses. But as, as subdued by Milarepa, 
And then in subsequent generations, there are so many stories where they show up at different yogis or lamas when they're doing certain retreats and practices, and they say, Aha! Now, Milarepa's made us into good goddesses, and we are nice and behave. But we also are interested to see if there are any fake yogis around who are just trying to get power to be bossy about people and to dominate them. And so we're going to give you a little test like we did to Milarepa. And now maybe I think we're going to gobble you down. And they go through the whole thing with them. And then we see, they see whether these beings are going to fight them and try to dominate them or whether they're going to surrender to them and use the occasion as opportunity to sort of give themselves to the thing. So this is a beautiful thing. See, the, the Mount Kailash deity, Chakrasambara, is this, is this um, deity of bliss, you know, but the bli- and compassion and bliss. What? What? It's outside, they're outside. They're outside the tent. Oh, oh, oh. I didn't think Peggy knew Hindi. <laughs> <laughs> and, and <it> was Peggy. <laughs> I don't like you, Peggy. <laughs> And uh, and so it's kind of it. The point. This is a very important point because, for example, Stefan Beyer, who for a time was professor in Wisconsin, and wrote a good book on Tara. Actually, if you ignore what he says, if you do, he's he's a good linguist, and his translations about the Tara rituals are beautiful, called the Cult of Tara. But his own interpretation of Tantra is totally wrong. And there is a big interpretation of Tantra that Tantra is about power, getting power, you know, both Hindu and Buddhist. And it's, that's very wrong and bad and not right. And, and, and people should rightly reject that. The power, there is great power, of course, in life. But the power comes from love and self-sacrifice and surrender. The power comes from the other people. It's like I always say... The reason that the Buddhists, although there's an infinity of everything, there's an infinity of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, and there's an infinity of devils, too, and bad people. So then the question is, well, are we going to be Manichaean here? Are we going to have infinite evil, infinite good, endless struggle, you know, which I think afflicted the Southern Baptists. I think they're a bunch of Manichaeans. You know, evil, access of evil, all this crap, justifying their own bad behavior. Or is there some reason that we should have faith that the good is more powerful. And I always have my, this is my patented formula that I've never gotten, I always share with anybody. I always patent, why do I say patent? It's my own little way of trying to explain it. Evil only means the demon of self-centeredness and of self-preoccupation and self-addiction and me, 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 me. No, that's the evil. Because out of that you harm yourself and other people. You can't help it. We're under pressure. You, know, you can be nice too, but you will harm. And you harm yourself, certainly. And good is the opposite. It is, forget about me, not by just suppressing my me, but by actually eliminating it by understanding its invalidity. By seeking to verify whether there's any reason for me, 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 and find discovering there it is no good reason for it. And it's a, it's a mistaken, it's a self-defeating approach to the world. And then substituting for that, they, 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 you, 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 for me, me, me. And so a Buddha is a being that is only powered by... Buddhas, a Buddha is a being that has achieved a state of unity with infinity. They have no need to manifest. They don't need to come and drink Tibetan cup of tea. They don't need a piece of chocolate. They don't even need to breathe air. They're not, uh, to, uh, they don't need to, to they develop a form that is separate from other things that have a skin. They don't. They're just vast bliss, an infinite field of bliss. And so there's no reason for them even to, like, walk around Mount Kailash or be Mount Kailash, except that they feel, being identified completely with everything, they feel all these beings as themselves who feel separated from everything and are freaking out all the time and are doing all the wrong things, everything to make themselves feel worse, thinking that it's going to make them feel better. So a Buddha's energy is drawn from the need of all those beings to find some way to unravel the knot of self-centeredness and become other-centered, genuinely so, and naturally so, and then happily so. And that's all that powers a Buddha. Whereas an evil being, even a, the king of the demons, Mara, is powered by just me, me, me. Like, I want to torture somebody, or I want to get some oil, or I want to do something. That's a demon. So, <coughs> my formula is as follows. Infinity times one. 
of evil beings is less than infinity to the infinite power. <coughs> so the power of the, of the enlightened being in Tantra, whether you call it Tantric or not Tantric, comes from that being's being having the energy of the need of infinite numbers of beings. Right? So it's, it's infinite in that sense. Whereas the evil one who's just for themselves has only one kind of infinity, not infinite infinities. You follow me? So the key about Tantra is, and the key about Milarepa's story that I wanted to say is, the key about Kailash is, although there is power, the source of the power is not ego aggrandizement. It's not, I'm so great. It's not me and mine. It is, what can I do for others? And the power is from them, actually. And therefore, if I can give myself to them, then, then that's what the power is about. And that's what Milarepa discovered in encountering those goddesses of the Himal. That's why he was so warm. He was, with the, again, the fire of Dumo, you could learn to bring the fire of Dumo out of the atoms of, enter, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the rocks of the world, your, of your own belly. Not because you know some trick, but the warmth is the loving interconnectedness with all beings. That's where the heat comes from. It's because it's, it's in the atoms of all beings, and then you keep war, you generate this flame, which then warms them. You know, that's the key point. Okay, so that's Milarepa. That's the story I wanted to tell about Milarepa. I, I just I really want to make that point about tantra. It's not it's not some sort of egocentric power. It is not in that sense a, cha a change from Buddhism's basic selflessness teaching about how you know things go well, not with coke but with selflessness <laughs> and with compassion and altruism. You know, things go well with altruism. I know it's hard to believe. We feel that it's so difficult. People are so unappreciative. They just don't care. They just want their own things. And, they're that, and, they're, and that's why they make themselves unhappy. And as the Dalai Lama always says, it's so, it's, it's, if you're going to be selfish, I love this line, <laughs> if you're going to be selfish, why don't you try to be a wise selfish? He says, because selfish wants to be happy, but you never can be happy if you're selfish. So a wise selfish, in order to be happy and to accomplish their selfish interest, gives up being selfish. Because being selfish, <coughs> it's just, you're just never satisfied, that's all. Even Mick Jagger told us that. We didn't need Dalai Lama. He told us there ain't no satisfaction. He meant for a selfish person, but that's the only kind he what thought he knew. Man?